now uh, coming back here, the student ID and instructor ID is definitely a super key of advisor. But is it a candidate key? Um, can just the student ID uniquely identify an advisor relationship? Well, that depends. Um, if I said that the participation of student in the advisor relationship is uh, many to one. That means, uh, or if I use the cardinality constraint notation, which indicated a student can have at most one advisor. Now, if I have just the student ID, there is only one advisor. I do not need that instructor ID anymore to identify the particular relationship. So, in this case, when I have a cardinality constraint, the pair student ID, instructor ID continues to be a super key, but it is not minimal. I can just take the student ID and that would be minimal. Therefore, if I have a cardinality constraint of many to one or one to many, only one of the two uh, super keys from the two entity sets is required. That will be the primary key of this relationship. Set. And finally, what about the one to one case? It turns out either of them is good enough. You know, if I have two uh, keys from the two entity sets in a one to one relationship, together they are a super key. Each of them is also a super key because uh, you know, each one can participate in only one relationship. So, each of them itself is a super key and in fact, each of them is a candidate key. So, we have two candidate keys and we have to choose a primary key. So, this is something which the designer decides that this is going to be the primary key for this relationship. Okay. So, we have done a fair number of concepts. Now, I want to uh, focus on certain errors, which are very common when people do ER diagrams. The first and the most common error is confusing ER diagrams with schema diagrams, where a schema diagram lists all the attributes, which we are going to create in the eventual relational model. So, uh, remember that the ER model is just a step towards creating a relational model in the end, because pretty much all databases out there are relational. So, we do ER modeling as a higher level way of understanding what is going on. And then, we are going to uh, convert the ER model into a relational model. And we will see later how to do this. But the fact that we are going to convert it means we are going to have a set of attributes and people often start thinking ahead of time as to what those attributes will be and stick them into the ER diagram. So, what happens if you do that? Mm, we knew that instructor has department name in the relational schema. If we started off with the ER diagram, but we jumped ahead and said, oh, we want to put department name as an attribute, we may end up with an entity set instructor with an attribute department name. And further, we have a department name entity. And then we will say, well, instructors are related to department. We want to represent this relationship by a relationship called inst depth. So, instructor department relationship. So, what do we have now? What is What have we landed up with? Instructor department a relationship, which is explicit. That is correct actually. But there is also an attribute in instructor department name, which is actually an implicit relationship between instructor and department, because in our minds, we knew this should be a foreign key referencing department. So, the model of this story is, we have landed up with duplication and we have landed up with an implicit relationship. Both are to be avoided. And the fix here is to never ever have an implicit relationship through attributes. Make it explicit by a relationship and throw away the attribute. Throw away the department name attribute from instructor. Yes, we may in the eventual relational design, we may reintroduce that attribute, but do not put it in the ER model, because we already want, we want to explicitly have a relationship indicating which department an instructor is in. In fact, if we put a department name as an attribute, we are tying our hands behind our back. Why? What can go wrong? Well, today maybe uh, instructors have a single associated department. Uh, we assume that, um, but maybe uh, we need a case where an instructor should have two departments. What do we do then? If we made it an attribute, then uh, you know we sh we are stuck. We can't put a second department. 
So, in that case, we should really have had a different representation. We will see how it should have been done. But the moral of the story is, when you are doing the ER diagram, go in steps. Do not make this assumption right away. Show the relationship, decide on the cardinality constraints of that relationship. In the end, after going through it carefully, we may decide as we did that department name should go with instructor, because we decided finally that instructor should not have two departments. But we did this after thinking it through. We did not do it randomly. If we did it randomly, maybe uh, you know the right decision should have been the other way. We did not think about it, we ended up making the wrong decision. And a mistake in the schema is really hard to correct. Once you build an application uh, with department name as an attribute, then you realize, oops, there is a problem, I need two departments for an instructor, we are in trouble. Because you have to go change the schema, which means all the application programs have to change and it is a lot of work. So, you have to be careful with the schema design. Now, uh, we had several examples of relationships between the same entities, which, which use the same entity multiple times in a relationship. We uh, discussed this father and mother relationship. If I had an entity set person, the relationship father is between a person and another person. So, it is actually a linking back, looping back to the same entity set. Here is another example. I have courses and then I have prerequisites, uh, because a course may require a prerequisite. You should have done this prerequisite course before doing this other course. Now, this is a relationship which indicates which all courses are prerequisites for each course. So, this is a relationship which has two edges, it is a binary relationship. Both the edges go back to course. Now, I need to know which one is the course and which is the prereq. If I just say that prereq uh, has C S 3 5 2 and C S 3 1 3, what does it mean? Is 3 5 2 a prereq for 3 1 3 or is 3 1 3 a prereq for 3 5 2? I will get confused. Therefore, I need to make explicit which one is the prerequisite for which one. So, the way I do it is I am going to put role labels on edges. So, one edge I am going to say is course ID and the other edge is a prereq ID. So, this indicates that this is a prereq for this course. So, that is uh, how we uh, have uh, role labels on edges whenever a relationship loop has the same entity participating more than once. Now, even if you did not have the same entity participating more than once, it may still make sense to have role labels in certain other situations. So, you can always put a role label on an edge any time where you want to make explicit what it is. Okay. And this point in my course, I normally stop and ask for suggestions from students saying, let us do an ER diagram interactively. This is something which I find very nice, because it makes students think and I would strongly encourage you to also do this in your classes. Now, it is a little hard to uh, get uh, feedback uh, in a continuing basis uh, through video, but I am going to give it a try anyway. We have about 10 minutes to the break. So, what I am going to do is ask you to uh, indicate on a view, if you have a suggestion on something which we should be, which, which we can try to model uh, to create an ER model for something. So, if you had a question about what we have covered so far, please turn off the um, indication on a view. At this point, I am only asking for people who have suggestions on some model which we want to create. So, now let me go and see if somebody still has their hands raised on a view. Okay. NIT Warangal has its hands up. So, let me take a question from NIT Warangal, not a question, a suggestion. NIT Warangal. Do you have a suggestion for what we should model? If you have, please go ahead. Sir, my question is about the attributes. What is the difference between a simple attribute and a single valued attribute? Over to you, sir. Okay. A single valued attribute is what is not a multi valued attribute. So, for example, we had a composite attribute such as address, which had parts. I would still refer to address as a single valued composite attribute. Now, if there were multiple addresses, then I would say that address is a multi-valued attribute. But coming back, I 
this is a perfectly good question, um, but I would like suggestions on something to do an ER model for at this point. I will take questions certainly in a little bit. Do you have any suggestions on anything which you want us to try modeling on the fly? Hello? Can you hear me, sir? Yes, please go ahead. teaching this particular subject for quite a long time and uh, we, uh, we certainly in this sixth uh, edition you have changed the ER model and uh, how this is going to impact the community that is what I wanted to know number one and number two is that uh, as you have asked for some suggestions on the different applications on ER design uh, actually uh, in our uh, colleges, we do float some BTEC projects and each project has got certain uh, level of uh, database designing. Based on this, actually we have got a, a project uh, where uh, we develop applications for a data consultancy service where they are actually uh, giving us some problems and can we take that as a problem and we can uh, proceed with that. Okay, so uh, let me answer the first part of the question and uh, the answer to the second part is yes, do uh, give us a suggestion once I hand over the mic back to you. But first let me answer the first part of the question. Uh, we have been using a certain notation for a long time. Now suddenly, uh, you know, one textbook out of several goes and changes the notation. What do we do about this? Uh, what is the impact? Now, I would suggest for a couple of years, uh, you make sure students are aware, aware of both the notations. So, if they um, go and use a place where they see the other notation, they need to understand what it means at the very least. Or if they are in an exam where they are asked to, uh, you know, use that notation, then they should be able to use it. So, although in this lecture, I have only covered the new notation, uh, we do have a few examples of how the old notation corresponds to the new notation and uh, probably you should encourage your students to do one or two designs using the old notation, so they are familiar with it. But uh, it is not a unilateral decision, it is not that we decided today that the old is, uh, notation is bad and we are the first ones to adopt the new one. Industries have for a long time been using uh, UML uh, class notation and uh, we felt that uh, it makes sense to move closer to that. Uh, it is more compact, um, the ER models, uh, diagrams, ER diagrams become very big often, uh, unnecessarily occupying space. Um, it does keep some students happy because their reports are now 40 pages instead of 30, but that is not a good criterion for what is a good notation. Uh, so, we decided uh, we would use this new notation. So, I hope that answers your question. Uh, people do need to know both these notations, even before people needed to know it really, because if they go to industry, they are going to use class diagrams, which correspond to our new notation. So, they already needed to know both. We are just shifting what is more important, what is less important. And now back to you and go ahead and give a suggestion. Uh, actually, in, in our case, uh, there is a particular peculiar kind of problem. The problem is that uh, Tata company has uh, actually tried to establish or open up a company in our area and hence uh, they actually shifted the people from that particular place to another place. There is a shifting. Uh, so, uh, they wanted to keep track of uh, the details about those people who were being shifted and what is their uh, criteria and all those that. Uh, but they were unable to uh, look at the details about these people because of the variety and the diversity in the different uh, uh, informations. They could not uh, track it out. Hence, they said uh, if somebody could help us to look at and track out uh, what is going on, then perhaps it will be easy. So, we took the uh, initiative and we collected certain information related to the people who have been shifted from one particular place to another place. So, can we model this particular problem using this ER model, whether it is possible or not? That is what I wanted to know. Okay. Um, it seems like uh, 
you know, in terms of VR modeling, uh, this could certainly be done. It does not seem terribly hard in fact. So, it is a good example to do very quickly. Uh, in terms of the problems that TCS had doing this, it is certainly not from the ER modeling perspective. Uh, I am sure the problems they had were uh, other practical issues in uh, getting this information from existing databases. Uh, but to model this as in an ER uh, model, so let us first list what are the entities. So, first of all, we have persons. These are the persons who we are tracking. We could have uh, even call it employee, uh, but let us uh, just call it person for the moment. I hope you are able to see the whiteboard now. We are going to model uh, several entities here. We have a person entity. Then uh, you said that people were uh, shifted from one location to another. Um, so, I assume that by location, uh, they mean a specific facility or an office of that company. And that office may be in a particular town perhaps also. I do not know whether they wanted to model this, but let us say we model an office, which is a physical office of that company. Maybe we also want to model the fact that multiple offices may be in a particular city. Maybe shifting people from one office in the city to another uh, does not count as a transfer, but shifting across cities would count as a transfer. So, we need to know which city or town that office corresponded to. So, that is another entity. Um, I am unable to think of any other entities right now. As I said, it is a very simple design here. Um, maybe there is also a position which a person held. Um, so, perhaps we want to model we may want to model position as an entity. On the other hand, we may also model it just as an attribute depending on the needs. So, this is for a point in time. I, I can say who is currently at which place. But now, I think a core part of uh, the question which you have raised is to keep track of the history. Who was where at what point? And in fact, this is a very nice motivation uh, for a problem which is very real, which is we not only want to model the current point in time in an ER diagram, we may also want to model history. What was the state yesterday? What was the state last year? And so forth. So, the question is how do we model these temporal aspects in an ER diagram? And it turns out that the basic ER diagram is not very good. It does not provide very good support for modeling these temporal aspects. Uh, so, that can be an issue. Um, so, let us see how we can do it here with, without introducing any new features. Uh, there have been proposals uh, by various researchers to extend ER diagrams with uh, specific constructs for modeling temporal issues, uh, but none of them has uh, really been viewed as uh, completely satisfactory in general purpose solution. So, none of those has actually been adopted widely. So, temporal aspects have to be modeled at a low level. There is no higher level way of saying that here is a relationship, it also has time associated with it without explicitly storing time attributes. So, we are going to store time attributes explicitly. So, let us say that um, person is related to an office by let us say we will call it posting. So, posting is a relationship between a person and an office where the person is posted. Now, you said that uh, persons uh, postings may change. So, we want to know who was at this office earlier in this period of time and so forth. So, since this may change over time and we want to track who was where at what time, we are forced to um, use a attribute of posting, which is period start and end. This is the same thing that we did earlier. And this is a multi valued attribute, because the same person may be posted back in the same office again after some time. So, which were the periods of time when this person was posted in this particular office. Now, supposing we have a constraint that a person can be posted at only one office at a time. You may be tempted to model this constraint. Um, by the way, there should have been a dashed line connecting this. I ran out of space at the top of the figure. So, I was forced to stick it 
right next to the relationship, but actually there should be a dashed line there. Now, coming back, uh, how do we model the constraint that a person can have at most one uh, posting at a point in time? Uh, you may think that we can put an arrow here, uh, that is the notation we discussed later, that uh, earlier rather, that uh, when you put an arrow to in this side towards, if we put an arrow over here uh, from person to office, that would indicate a person can have at most one office. Unfortunately, uh, this prevents a person from having different offices at different points in time. So, this is what I meant by explicit support. I cannot model the constraint that a person can have only one office at a time using ER notation. There is no way to do this once I take time into account. I cannot do this. Therefore, I cannot throw in this constraint. The only way to do it is to write this constraint in words separately, um, but there is no notation in the ER diagram notation for it. Okay. Now, what about uh, other things in here? Office could be located in city, so that is a straightforward relationship which links office and city. Uh, now, let us come to the harder part. What about the position that a person is in? So, now um, a person may be in a particular office, he may have a particular position. Uh, he may continue to be in the same office, but the position may change. Uh, how do I deal with this? Or the person may go to a different office with a different position. So, one way of doing this is to actually turn this into a ternary relation. Posting is a ternary relation, which links a person, an office and a position. And it has a period. In fact, this works fine, because a person can be in the same office with two different positions at two different periods of time. Um, can a person have two positions in the same office at the same point in time? This happens. Sometimes, you know, person is holding a particular job, but maybe, a, you know, I am a professor here, but I may also be uh, in charge of something. I may be a head of a department. I am not, but I could have been the head of a department. I could have been a dean. So, there are many possible positions that a person may hold concurrently and this can certainly model that. A person in a particular office can have different positions. So, there are no cardinality constraints here. Um, I, we mentioned earlier that we are going to cover cardinality constraints only for binary relationships. Um, with ternary and higher degree relationships, if you start drawing arrow notation, it gets very confusing what it means. People have uh, actually, there are different papers or textbooks, which have different interpretations of the same diagram, which causes confusion. So, we decided let us not use any notation, which actually causes such confusion. And we are going to, in, in, a, in our book, we mentioned that if you have a ternary relationship, we will allow at most one arrow out of it, which means that, let us say, if I draw an arrow here to posting that would be a constraint that this person can have in this office can have at most one position. That would also be wrong temporally, because the same person may have one position at this point in time and another position at another point in time in the same office. So, we are not even going to draw any arrows. So, we are just going to leave it unconstrained here. So, this diagram now includes person, office, position, posting with period located in city. So, let us uh, get back to uh, our uh, people from Warangal and see if they have any input on this. I'm Warangal, I am selecting you again and let us hear from you if uh, this solved your problem or there were other aspects of the design. Now, I should mention before I hand over the mic to you that any ER uh, modeling process is iterative. So, I understood a little bit of what you wanted. I may have been completely wrong in what I understood. I may have been partially correct and you, the customer, will come back to me and say, no, this is wrong or this is okay. And then, I will refine my ER diagram correspondingly. So, customer from Warangal, over to you. Part of the solution, uh, this is one part where the office uh, part is taken care of. But, uh, of course, uh, there are certain as other aspects like uh, they were dealing with some local people also. Uh, so, those uh, people's information will, were also been uh, taken care of, is to be taken care of. 
so anyway uh, this part is okay sir and uh, i have a question can i uh, ask it right now related to the topic that you discussed okay uh, let me uh, answer part of your question the first part uh, good that it is partially correct but it uh, the first iteration usually will not cover all the information required in this particular case uh, so I, I understand what you said as there are some local people who are not employees so maybe we want persons who are employees and then persons who are not employees and we are going to see later in the uh, post break session how to model uh, these by using specialization i'm sure most of you already know this concept but uh, we could have used that concept to refine a person into employee and um, maybe a, a contractor or some such uh, so, with that, uh, back to you, so you can ask your follow on question. Back to Varang. Actually, in some books, I back found that Varang. there is a mention of uh, entity types. Uh, uh, could we uh, know what is the difference between an entity type and an entity set? Uh, so, some people, uh, especially in the object oriented world, uh, they have a notion of a type which is just defines what are the attributes. Now, that does not mean there is a unique set of that type. So, um, maybe I will have a person type which says that you know the person type should have name, uh, address, blah, blah. And then I will create entity sets, employee, consultant, contractor, whatever, from which all have the same type person type. Okay, so, this is one way of modeling which is natural for people who have uh, been using a programming language where there is a notion of a type, but the type is not associated with a set. For the database world, people assume that there are sets with types and there is no need for a separate type. If you go to the object relational uh, extensions of SQL, they actually introduce both these notions. They end up introducing a notion of a type and then a notion of an extent or a set uh, of things of a particular type. So, I, I hope that answered your question. I am not sure what the textbooks you have looked at mentioned, but I think this is what they probably mean by type. Back to you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, actually, uh, I wanted to also know about the total participation and the partial participation. What does actually they mean? Okay. So, this will be the last question. So, the question was what is the difference between total and partial participation. Uh, I think I explained this uh, in one of the, in, in a couple of examples. One was uh, section and course, where a section must have an associated course. So, I linked a section and a course by a relationship sec course. So, to say that a section must have a related course, I am saying that section must participate in the relationship sec course. In other words, the participation of section in the relationship sec course is total. Partial means it is optional. Optional means the section may not have an associated course, but here I want it to be mandatory, therefore it is total. That is the difference between partial and total. Like I said that if you have questions, you can submit it via chat and we have uh, several questions here. The first question is, how do you create or alter table with single attribute, single valued attribute to multi valued attribute? Uh, this is a question uh, not so much about the ER model, but about the relational representation. Uh, the standard first normal form does not even allow multi valued attributes. So, in the second half of today's lecture, we are going to see how to convert ER diagrams to tables, and there we will see how to model multi valued attributes as tables. Um, another question from uh, DAIST Gandhinagar, similar question like person, father, mother. The question is employee, manager and supervisor. I am um, not sure what is the difference between manager and supervisor. Uh, in some places they would mean the same thing, but perhaps uh, you mean uh, supervisor who is immediate and then a manager who is next level up perhaps. Should it be a ternary or should it be binary relationships? Um, in an organization where uh, there is a strict hierarchy. For a person, you only need to know who is their immediate uh, boss, which maybe you would call supervisor or manager, depending on how you call it. And then, if you see who is the boss of your boss, maybe that is what you call manager. I am not sure if that is what you mean, but 
I'm going to interpret it like that. So then, there is only need for a single binary relationship which says who is the boss of who. There is no need for a ternary relationship. But if you have other situations where your supervisor may report to multiple people, your supervisor has two bosses, but you are under one of the two bosses of your supervisor. So, maybe your supervisor is in charge of two separate sections and for each of those sections your supervisor reports to two different bosses, uh, then you may need to have a ternary relationship. But then again, maybe not. Maybe a better way is to say that you belong to this division and this person is the supervisor of that division and therefore, it is very clear this person may be the supervisor of two divisions, that is okay. And maybe this other person is the next level person responsible for this division. So, we also record who is the immediate supervisor for a division, who is the, uh, maybe we can have a hierarchy of divisions and for each level in the hierarchy, who is the manager for that level of the hierarchy. Most organizations do this. They have division, subdivision, sub subdivision and at each, this is a tree, at each node they would have a manager who is also the manager for whoever is below in that tree. So, this is often called an organizational hierarchy and it is a very common situation. Uh, there is no need for a ternary uh, relationship in any of this. The next question is how to insert null value for date data type. Uh, regardless of the data type in SQL, if you give the value null without quotes, you can insert it uh, into any data type. So, date is not special there. Um, the next question is, is showing cardinality limits more correct than showing arrows? Um, certainly, with cardinality constraints, you can express things beyond what you can express with arrows. So, supposing the limit is 5, you can have between uh, 0 and 5 advices. You cannot depict that using arrows, but you can depict it by saying 0 dot dot 5. So, it is more powerful, but the most common situation is uh, many to one or one to many. So, in most situations the arrow is good enough and covers what we need, it is easy enough to understand. But if you have something more complex, use cardinality constraints. The next question is a very good question. Uh, this is related to quiz 1 today. Instead of having two binary relationships, father and mother, can we model that with just one binary relationship called parent? with an attribute to indicate whether the parent is father or mother. Uh, that is actually a very good question. Uh, in fact, that is one of the alternatives I thought of putting in the uh, quiz, but I decided not to confuse people with it, but it is actually a very good point. Um, in the normal uh, situation of things, uh, if we just associate uh, gender with each person, whether male or female, and we just have a parent relationship, then it is very obvious that by looking at the gender of the parent, you can see whether the parent is a mother or father, that is obvious. Um, of course, this uh, gets very complicated when we have people changing genders. Luckily, that is very rare, so probably we do not care. But uh, if you were in a situation where that matters, well, then maybe you need a, a slightly different approach. One approach is to have two relationships. Another approach is to have an attribute with the relationship. So, it is a parent relationship with an attribute which indicates whether that person is the father or the mother. Uh, of course, this is slightly uh, silly in this example, but there are many cases where you need a tag like this. All you need is a tag to indicate some extra information about that particular relationship. Next question says, what is wrong with person relation having attributes as father, mother? since a person will have as you specified only one role to play. Um, so, this question is again back to the relation, not the relationship, but the table we create out of it. If we create a table, indeed you can have an attribute called father and an attribute called mother, but uh, when you are doing the year diagram, make relationships explicit. Do not put them as an attribute. Yes, the father attribute implicitly says, there is a relationship between this person and the father who is referenced, but do not do that. The goal of the ER diagram is to have one way of representing relationships, which is by having an explicit diamond with the relationship in place, use that. Even if you know that eventually it will become an attribute, do not do that. Uh, here it is very clear a person may have only one father, um, although um, in the US uh, this gets very confusing, where uh, there are uh, 
many uh, people of the same gender who are married and then they have kids also. So the kids have two fathers or two mothers. This gets very confusing. Uh, so maybe the assumption that there is only one father or one mother breaks down in such situations. So it is better to have explicitly represented a relationship and then said that yes, we have decided that we are not going to care about the case where you want two fathers or two mothers. We are not going to model that. But make it explicit. Do not do it implicitly. Okay. So that ends the questions. Um, with that, I will move on to the second half of this talk. So the very first uh, topic here is weak entity sets. There is a lot of confusion amongst people who have seen this topic as to what is a weak entity set, what is a strong entity set. The first definition which we see anywhere is the what we have in the first bullet. An entity set that does not have a primary key is referred to as a weak entity set. But any intelligent person may come up and say, but wait, you are the one who created an entity set and its attributes. What prevented you from putting a, a primary key? Why did you not put it? I mean, this seems silly. Is uh, If you simply forgot to put the primary key for something, does that automatically make it a weak entity set? The answer is no. It is actually, a, there is a deeper uh, significance to what is going on here. And I, this will become clear when we see the examples coming up. So, for the moment, just stick to this definition. Now, whenever we have a weak entity set, we normally do this if there is, only if there is a corresponding identifying entity set. So, in some sense, this weak entity set is a component of this identifying entity set. So, to understand uh, this situation, uh, let us take a bill which you get in a hotel. So, it says uh, two masal dosas at this rate, this cost, one vada at this rate, here is the cost and then there is a total. This is the bill. Now, how do you represent this in a relational database? Uh, if you allowed multi-valued uh, structured attributes as in the ER model, you could do it. Um, but if you did not, you cannot do that. And even if you just stick to the ER model, it might make sense to model a bill not as one single thing. There is an entity corresponding to the bill, but each line of that bill can be thought of as a uh, relationship um, or an entity itself, which relates to what is the item, you know, this line relates to the entity masal dosa, this line relates to the entity vada and this is entity also is related to this bill. So, the line of a bill can be thought of as an entity, but this entity has no meaning without having a bill itself. How can you have a line in a bill if the bill does not exist? So, what this means is that this is a weak entity whose existence depends on the parent entity. If the parent entity goes, this should also go. This is exactly the kind of situation which weak entities would model. Now, uh, once we have this in mind, if we have a primary key for the parent entity, the identifying entity, what we need in the weak entity is simply something like a line number. This line is the first line in the bill, this is the second line, third line. The bill number comes from the parent identifying entity. That is basically why this individual entities do not have a primary key. We will see it uh, easier to understand example coming up. Uh, we are going to uh, in the ER diagram notation, the identifying entity is linked to the weak entity and we need to know which one it is. The weak entity may be linked to many different entities, but only one or a few of those may constitute an identifying entity. So, we are going to use as a standard a double diamond to show that this relationship links a weak entity to its identifying entity. So, that is how we are going to do it. And one other concept here is a discriminator is the set of attributes that distinguishes amongst all the entities of a weak entity set. So, what does this mean? I said line number for a bill. Right? So, if we just keep line number 1, 2, 3, 4, these line numbers occur in many different bills, but within a single bill, the line number occurs only once. So, it is not a primary key across all line numbers 
entities, but within a single bill it is unique. So, it is a discriminator. So, now let us see all of these concepts using a course section and I will explain why we modeled it as a weak entity set. So, first let us see what we are modeling. We have courses C S 317 is the database course in IIT Bombay. Now, every year uh, either I or somebody else here teaches this course. So, C S 317 is taught every autumn of every year and a student is registered for one of these years in autumn. From this year we started having two sections of the course not just one. Um, so, we need to identify whether the student took the section which I taught or whether the student took the section which Professor Umesh Bellur taught. So, we need a section identifier. Therefore, a section is identified in the relational table if you recall a section is identified by course ID, section ID, year and semester. So, let us say we start off by saying a section is an entity, course is an entity and now if you see section has course ID in there, course has course ID and clearly the course ID in section should have refer to the course ID in course and therefore, it is a relationship. This attribute indicates that this section is related to this course. So, we do not want such relationships to be implicit. So, what we are going to do is remove the attribute course ID from the section entity and add a relationship to course which is sec course which is what you see in this diagram here. Section is now linked to section core by this relationship, but wait there is a problem course ID was part of the primary key for section which helped us uniquely identify it. If you remove it, what is left is no longer a primary key, course ID is required. So, what we are going to do is turn this relationship into an identifying relationship which helps us identify sections with one of the courses and the primary key for section is going to consist of the primary key for course plus whatever parts of the uh, you know unique identifier are left behind here which help us distinguish different sections of the same course. Here they are section ID, semester and year. <laughs> Notice that I have underlined them as before, but this time with a dashed line not a solid line. So, the section ID, semester and year are the discriminator attributes for this weak entity set section. The eventual primary key for this weak entity set will consist of the primary key of the identifying entity set course which is course ID coupled with section ID semester year. This is the relational schema which we use in that these were the primary key attributes. Okay. So, I hope now it is clear uh, why we ended up with a weak entity set. So, to recall very often you start off by deciding that something is an entity set, then you realize that to identify it uniquely you need a uh, attribute which is really a reference to another entity set and that is when you realize that this is actually dependent. If a course does not exist, a section cannot exist for that course. So, we will say that this section is existence dependent on the course. To make something a weak entity, this existence dependency is required. If a section could exist without a course, then we cannot actually represent it as a weak entity but we know it has to have a course. So, it that is why we make it a weak entity. So, we end up starting with something which we thought was a strong entity and then turn it into a weak entity. Now, what if I put an identifying relationship and also put course ID in here. If I have both a relationship and course ID as an attribute, then certainly section would be a strong entity. There is a relationship linking section with course but now there is duplication. The course ID in section conveys the same information as this relationship section course conveys. We are duplicating information. Therefore, we should not keep the course ID as an explicit attribute. Let it be only represented by the uh, relationship. So, I hope that answered a question which somebody had asked regarding what are weak entities. So, why do we need them? So,
this is this slide is basically summarizing what I just told you. Uh, the primary key of the strong entity set is implicitly there in the weak entity set, but it is not stored explicitly. It is kind of inferred through the identifying relationship. And the reason we do not store it explicitly is that although it would make it a strong entity, it would be redundant with duplication. Okay. So, now we have an ER diagram for a university enterprise uh, on this slide. Unfortunately, uh, the font here is probably too small for you to read. Um, I apologize for that. I intended to break this into several parts, but uh, forgot to do it. Uh, if you have a copy of the book, you can uh, refer to the diagram in the book. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, I hope you will at least be able to read some parts of the diagram on the screen. So, this again is a toy university ER diagram. A real university ER diagram will be much more complicated. Moreover, it is not going to fit in one page. So, after I describe this, I will tell you how to take a complex ER diagram and split it into pages. I will come to that in a moment. But for the moment, uh, let us see what are the components of this ER diagram. So, let us start with departments. We have department name, building and budget. So, this was the same information as we had in the department relation. Now, we have student. We already saw this uh, entity and as we saw, department name of student was removed and instead we have a relationship student department linking student to department. If you can see this figure clearly, you will see that there is a double line from student to student department. What does that mean? The participation is total. Every student must belong to a department. The double line allows them to belong to two, three departments, but at least one. But moreover, there is an arrow on the opposite end here, which means that a student can only belong to one department. So, this says at least one, this says at most one which means exactly one. A student belongs to exactly one department. Similarly, if you come to the left hand side, an instructor in our uh, ER diagram must belong to exactly one department. Then we have an advisor relationship here linking student and instructor. Note the arrow which forces a student to have at most one advisor. Student cannot have two advisors. Uh, then here is a course entity, which has a course ID, title and credits. This is actually the same attributes as the uh, table we saw before, except that the department attribute is missing. That attribute has become a relationship course department out here. Just like we removed department from instructor, we have removed it from course also and turned it into a relationship. This is also a total participation and uh, there is an arrow which indicates a course must belong to exactly one department. Now, moving down, you will notice that prereq relates course to course. We have already seen this earlier. And moving further here, we have a section relation, uh, section entity, which as you note does not have a primary key. It only has dashed underline. So, it has a discriminator, which means it must have an identifying entity and the double diamond here indicates what is the identifying entity that is course. <coughs> Note a couple of more things here. The line between a weak entity and the identifying uh, relation, the relationship which identifies it has to be a double line. Why? If a particular section is not associated with a any course, it, uh, that does not make sense. You require a course to have a section, its existence is dependent, which is why we have a double line here. Furthermore, we have an arrow here. If you have a weak entity, it cannot be related to two different courses, that does not make sense. It is existence depend on one course. So, you must have an arrow. Whenever you have an identifying relationship, one side will be a double line, the other will have an arrow. Now, note that things which relationships which section participates in directly go to section. 
even though section is a weak entity, that does not prevent it from participating in various relationships. So, down here we decided that classroom is an entity which has a building uh, room number and capacity. Building and room number is a primary key, capacity is an attribute and each section must meet in a classroom. We are assuming that a section cannot meet in two different classrooms. A particular section meaning in a particular semester has just one classroom assigned to it and therefore, what we have done is section to classroom is relationship section class is many to one. So, there is an arrow here to classroom which means a section can have at most one classroom. Furthermore, there is a double line here meaning the section must have an associated classroom. You cannot have a section which does not have a classroom. Uh, this is a decision we made, but may not be realistic. There are sometimes self study courses uh, which run as a section, but do not have an associated classroom. In which case, we would have turned this into a single line, not a double line. And finally, uh, we have a time slot in IIT Bombay and in many places, there is a notion of a time slot, time slot 1, time slot 2, time slot 3, and each time slot has a set of associated meeting hours. So, in IIT Bombay, time slot 1 is 8.30 to 9.30 Monday, 9.30 to 10.30 Tuesday and so on. So, how do we represent this information? We decided time slot is an entity, which has a time slot ID 1, 2, 3, 4, and it has a multi-valued attribute, which itself has three components, day, start time and end time. So, day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, so forth, start time and end time. And it is multi-valued allowing the same time slot 1 to have hours on multiple days. So, that is the time slot entity. Each section is similarly uh, linked to a time slot entity and that is also a total participation. So, each section must have an associated time slot. Again, if you have a self study course, there is no time slot uh, in which case this would be a, a partial participation not total. And a section is not allowed to have two different time slots, therefore, there is an arrow to time slot. So, that is it for our university ER diagram. Uh, the next question is, what if the diagram is complicated? It is complicated. We managed to squeeze it into one page, which is readable at least in the book, but maybe not so readable on the screen. So, how do I take a diagram like this, which may be very big? and split it into multiple pages. So, let me show it by drawing. You come back to the whiteboard. So, the first principle when I break up an ER diagram into multiple pages is that there should not be in duplication. What do I mean by duplication? Now, a particular entity may participate in many relationships. This may get split over multiple pages. So, the entity will occur in multiple pages. That by itself is not duplication. Duplication will happen if I list the attributes of the entity in multiple places. So, one way to do it is to take each entity and show it once separately without showing any relationships, show the entity student id name and uh, total creds. Okay. So, that is a student entity. Similarly, I will draw the other entities on one page. I may even, if uh, space permits, um, I may even show some relationships on the same page. So, maybe student department is a relationship, uh, which I will show on the same page. But now, I have run out of space on this page, what do I do? So, maybe I need to know who is the advisor of a student and I did not have space to put that in here. So, then what I will do is I will take away this page. So to, so, to show that let me wipe out this whole thing. Now, I am on a new page. Here what I am going to do is student will now just be a box with no attributes. I am not going to show the attributes. An entity attributes are not depicted here. So, similarly maybe instructor its attributes were shown already somewhere else. Now, I am just going to show a box with no attributes and then here in this new page, I am going to have advisor. 
Okay. So, now there is no duplication of information and I have split the complicated ER diagram into multiple pages. So, if I had remembered this is exactly what I would have done uh, for this complex ER diagram to split it into multiple pages. So, the next topic in the sequence is how to take an ER diagram and convert it to relations. After all, we are not going to actually execute queries on the ER model, we have to convert it to relations. It is almost 100 percent true, but not quite 100 percent true, because recently um, Microsoft introduced a data model, which they call the entity data model, which is a lot closer to the ER model than to the relational model, but it is not quite exactly the ER model. Uh, so, if you are familiar with that, um, you will see why it is similar to the ER model. And it is possible in uh, certain ways to directly write a schema, which corresponds to ER schema, not bother about reducing it to tables. And then the uh, entity framework of which Microsoft has built will actually store the data in whatever form. If it is storing it on SQL server, it will actually convert it internally to a set of tables. Exactly what we are doing explicitly here manually, it may do automatically inside of the system. So, you do not have to concern yourself with those details. You can work at the entity and relationship level. You can write queries at this level using a query language which they have defined. However, uh, this is not widely used at this point and uh, it has its limitations. So, we are not going to cover that here. We will stick to the relational model and convert all our schemas in uh, all our ER models into relational schemas. How do you do that? Again, those of you who have taught the course would know all this, uh, but let me cover it in uh, quickly in any case. A strong entity converts directly to a table with the same uh, attributes, barring composite and multi-valued attributes. We have to do a little bit more to deal with composite and multi-valued attributes. So, simple single valued attributes can just become directly attributes. How about a weak entity? Uh, by the way, uh, the primary key of the strong entity will become a primary key of the uh, corresponding relation which we create. We are also going to create foreign keys in a way which we will see in a little bit. Now, a weak entity will also become a table. This time, we are actually going to copy the primary key attributes from the identifying relationship into this table. Uh, slight digression, the, so far I have assumed that each um, weak entity is identified by a single strong entity. There are situations which are a little more complex. So, there may be one weak entity which is identified by a strong entity and another weak entity which is identified by this weak entity. Think of it as a hierarchy. There is a strong entity set A, there is a weak entity set B which is existence dependent on A and then at a further level down, there is a set C which is existence dependent on B. This situation can arise and in the ER diagram, you are going to have a cascade. You will see that this is connected by an uh, identifying relationship to something which is itself a weak entity, it does not have a primary key, it only has discriminators. That in turn connects up to something else. Now, what do we do when we convert such a thing to tables? We have to first copy the primary key from the strong entity to the first of the weak entity sets and then it will get a primary key, which is the inherited primary key plus its discriminators and then from there we copy the whole thing into the next weak entity set. There are even situations where a particular entity set, weak entity set may existence depend on two different strong entity sets and then it will have to inherit the primary keys of both those entity sets down here. Uh, they are, these situations are rare, but they do occur. Coming back to our section uh, weak entity set, we are going to create a table corresponding to this with course ID, section ID, semester year. Now, you will notice that uh, both these tables are missing some attributes which were there in our original relational schema. What happened to them? 
well they are still there in relationships which we have to deal with. So, we are going to convert every relationship to a table, although in some cases we are going to merge those tables into entity tables as we will see. So, first of all a many to many relationship will have to have a table, where the um, primary key attributes are going to be copied from the corresponding entity set. So, for advisor relationship, we are going to copy the primary key of instructor and the primary key of student and then create a table containing these two primary keys. That represents the relationship advisor. So, you will notice here that the um, primary key are called id in both cases. You cannot have two attributes called id. So, when you do this mapping, you have to rename the attributes. So, we chose to rename them to i underscore id to in indicate instructor id, s underscore id to indicate student id. So, I am stopping here for the break.